So without any further ado, our first speaker today is Professor Titus Brown from Michigan State University. Titus, the table is yours. No more, no more. Right, so uh, my name's Titus Brown, and I am a professor at Michigan State University, go Spartans. Uh, and today I'm going to uh, have an opportunity to uh, define and scoop all of the people that follow after me, as Victoria has just pointed out, by um, basically uh, running through some of my personal uh, exper uh, experiences and observations regarding open source science and tools and approaches to be applied there too. Um, so uh, my, my rough table of contents is uh, here. It's th the two things I sort of want to talk about are one is how to engender collaboration. Uh, otherwise known as sucking people into your project and not letting them go. Um, the other is uh, automated testing, which is something that I think is, is, is um, not really very well uh, integrated into current programming or computer science curricula. And uh, it is one of the things, one of the two things that has changed my life with respect to science and programming. Uh, for those of you with an active internet connection, you can actually uh, read ahead here. Uh, I didn't actually send my slides to Greg in advance, so um, that's really the only place you can get them. Um, and uh, I guess without further ado, okay, so uh, conveniently, uh, I was watching over Victoria's shoulder as she was running through her slides, and um, she's going to cover this, I think, much better than, than I can in a single slide. Um, th should you do open source science? I'm basically predicating my entire talk on the notion that you have computational code, you want to make it available for other people to use. You want to uh, engender collaboration, perhaps not formal, but at least to the point where they are downloading your code and using it for their own stuff and maybe even contributing back ideas or source code to you. Why would you want to do this? Well, um, uh, it is not by any means the norm. And actually, Victoria does have some statistics, which is very nice because it, it makes it sound like this is uh, a, a, the big problem that it is. Um, so the ideological reason is that reproducibility and open communication are really at the heart of good science. Um, uh, and and that's, that's, been a, that's been a truth through the, through the, the centuries. Um, and a, an idealistic reason is that if you want to change the world, it's hard to change the world if you're both trying to do good science and keep your methods secret because people will be rightfully suspicious and uh, more importantly won't be able to build off of what you're doing. If you force people to re-implement everything you did in your last five papers, they will barely have time to do anything else interesting. Probably you won't get cited as much. And uh, odds are any mistakes you made will slip by because people simply won't bother um, reproducing your original results. Uh, this is a huge problem in, in bioinformatics, which is actually what I, what I do uh, in terms of science is bioinformatics and biology and developmental biology and sort of genomics and looking at, at, at things. And essentially you have... Uh, a lot of um, results in bioinformatics that, as far as we can tell, simply are reproducible and for a large variety of reasons. And one of those reasons is that uh, the source code for replicating the results is, is simply non-existent, even in the original lab, which is, of course, a whole other set of problems. Um, the really practical reason, and this is what you can usually convince your PI uh, it, it is a good enough reason to open source your code, is that maybe other people will actually help you. This is kind of a mirage for anybody who's actually been involved in running an open source project. It's more effort to keep on top of what other people are doing with your code than it is to simply do it yourself to some extent. But there is an open exchange of ideas and, and, and information that is more valuable, I think, than any uh, work you, ex extra work you have to do. Okay, so um, I don't want to pick any fights, but uh, I think the idea of closed source science is oxymoronic, and there are a number of people that agree with me. Not not all of them by any means. And I have heard reliable reports that, at, for example, the uh, molecular biology conferences, there are big arguments over whether or not journals should require source code to be published or not. And I, I don't even see what point there is in arguing about it. But um, so I'm just going to take that as a given. And we can have a fist fight outside by the wine and cheese later on. OK, so you've convinced someone to, you've convinced your boss and your university that you want to open source your science. Um, the first question people like to argue about after that is, what license? And I'm actually going to argue that, that that's a red herring. It doesn't matter. Odds are nobody's ever going to download your source code in the first place. So you don't really need to worry too much about constraining them in terms of what they can do with the source code. The real challenge is simply getting to the point where somebody actually downloads your project and uses it for something useful. 
So that's the first barrier that I'm trying to overcome. I, I don't know if people have looked at SourceForge. I think less than 5% less than of projects there are active, or sorry, less than 20% of projects there are active and less than 5% have more than one developer. So that, that tells you something about the reuse of things. And this is a situation where the, where the code's up there, it's on SourceForge, it's available for download, there's nothing stopping people except themselves. So uh, I personally prefer the BSD over the GPL at this point. My university prefers the GPL because then they can hope to make money off of it at some point. Um, uh, I, don't, I really don't think it matters. Okay, the real question, as I alluded to, uh, as I outright said, is how do you attract users? And this, I think this really is the number one concern when you're um, trying to jumpstart an open source project, open source science project. Uh, okay, so I like to subtitle my talks Solving Social Problems with Technology, which is generally held to be um, not a good thing to try uh, because you, you generally cannot. Uh, however, after thinking about that a little bit, um, I have, I've been unable to find a good source for this statement, incidentally. So if people can, if there's one famous person like Einstein or something that, that said that, I would be interested in knowing who, who said that. But um, I, I do think that technology can remove barriers. It cannot... It cannot uh, solve the problem, but it can help make the problem easier to solve via other, other uh, me methods. Okay, so every open source project should have a place to get the latest release, a mailing list, and an openly accessible version control system. There's really no excuse not to have that at this point. And you can see why, right? Okay, somebody's interested in your source code. Well, maybe you should tell them what the latest thing that w actually works is. Uh, people want to be able to know, people want to be able to communicate with you. You can give them your email address, but then that creates the um, illusion that you're the only person working on, or the, perhaps reveals the reality that you're the only person working on the, mail, on, the, on the project. If you give them a mailing list, they can say, oh my gosh, this is a big thing. This is a big deal. Um, plus, another, another convenient thing about a mailing list is that the archives can be, uh, accessible to, can be made accessible to Google. Uh, so people can stumble across your project when they're asking other kinds of questions. That's another way to suck people into your project. Um, and of course, an openly accessible version control system. I think this is where most people do not, uh, most people are on board with the idea that if you have an open source software package somewhere, somehow people should be able to download it. Uh, fewer people seem to be on board, and this is in the sciences in particular, with the idea that um, a mailing list is a good idea. And uh, people are horrified at the thought that, that that someone can look at the latest source code that they've committed, perhaps pursuant to publishing a paper. Right? Suppose you're in the middle of working on a paper and you've been making those commits to the version control system. Right? You have to go back to my uh, original comment, um, my original point, which is that nobody's going to look at your source code anyway. So don't worry too much about it. Stop putting barriers between your code and other people. Really, it, it, the challenge is just to get somebody to pay attention. So there's these issues about wikis and issue trackers. They're useful if you have the time and manpower to maintain them. Most scientists do not, uh, especially if they're working. If most graduate students or postdocs. It's, it's kind of ancillary to the goal of doing their, their real work. Um, by the way, I, since everybody's sort of sitting there like a couch potato, uh, despite what Greg said, you can ask me questions, um, and I will answer them. And I will cut my talk short in the hopes that I actually answer questions that are of interest to people rather than just going through my slides. So please do, especially if you're a student, please ask, ask questions. The only person that I would like to not ask questions until the very end is Greg. <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, and, and those of you who know him know why. So, uh, right, so the great thing about this is that you don't even have to decide which of these things, which of these issues you're going to support and how you're going to support them because SourceForge, Google Code, GitHub, Gatorius, Bitbucket, all of these sites will provide you with free open source, free hosting for your open source project. Absolutely 100% free. The only thing you have to do is literally click create project and come up with a name and a license. But as I said, that doesn't matter. The only interesting and angsty decision you have to make at this point is whether or not to go with the distributed version control or not. Now, um, later on I'm going to have a little slide, but Everybody here knows what I'm talking about with respect to version control. Um, let's see, there's always this trick, how do you ask questions? Uh, everybody who's heard of version control, raise your hand. Excellent. Okay, great. Uh, how about, okay, keep your hands up. Now, put them down if you've heard of or used distributed version control. 
OK. So that's actually really good. I can throw out like half my slides, so ask some questions. So um, OK, you all use version control. Uh, and I, I have to say that the, the Greg sort of intimidated me with the science 2.0 aspect of this. I don't, maybe I'm, maybe I'm on science 1.1. But um, you know, distributed version control has actually completely changed my life in the last six months to a year uh, with one of the projects I'm working on. I'm using Git. Um, but I think Mercurial or, or, or uh, the, other, the other version control systems out there would be equally life-changing. Um, it's completely awesome. And so um, the, the basic idea, right, is that uh, with Subversion, you have a central server, and the central server coordinates everything. So if developer A want to, wants to check out source code, they check it out. Uh, if, in the meantime, developer B makes a commit to the master, then developer A has to pull those commits, do the merge on their side before checking their changes back in at which point developer B can then go back to the well, get the source code, and make their own changes. All commits go through master. This is a relatively, if you understand version control, this is a, if you use version control, this is probably the model you use. And it's a reasonably understandable model. And it's this nice centralized model. You, you have complete control over what happens to your version, to, to your software and your version, um, and your uh, VCS repository. And it's, uh, it's, it's what everybody's been using one way or another for the last, I don't know, probably 30 years at this point. Decentralized is a lot more chaotic, and I, didn't, I could have put a lot more moving um, parts in here. But the basic idea is there's some origin of the source code, and developer A can check it out and work on it on their personal little laptop, personal little sandbox, where they're working on it, making commits to their local repository, which is just derived from origin but doesn't really have to maintain that link in any way. Developer B can do the same thing. And if and when developer B wants to communicate changes to developer A, all that, all that developer B has to do is push their changes into some public repository, which can either be the same as the origin if they have access, or if they're using GitHub or Gitorious or their own personal server, some repository that they're running that's accessible to developer A. And then developer A can pull those changes into their own repository and do what they wish to with them. Um, so why is this cool? Well, it basically decouples the developers from the master repository. It's good not only if your developer, if your central repository is going down, but also if you like to work on airplanes, which, which I've recently discovered is much nicer when you have distributed version control. Or if you want to, in the scientific sense, embark on a very long range, ranging research project where you're really not doing anything related to the original code, but you're making your own changes to make it work with your own project. Um, which is something that's difficult to do with Subversion without making all your changes visible on the master server. It's, ba it's basically impossible. It is a mixed blessing. There are a number of known problems with distributed version control. One of them is this tendency for code bombs. People, students, the, the, the more junior the programmer, the more often the programmer feels that their work is not worthy and doesn't want to communicate it back to the, to the master repository. Which means that at some point, six months down the road after the initial fork, uh, your undergrad will come to you with uh, you know, 300,000 changes or 30,000 changes in a patch and say, OK, everything's working now. Here you go. The problem with dropping that kind of code bomb is, of course, in the meantime, you've gone on and changed other things. Their code no longer integrates, and somebody has to merge the two. There are ways to mitigate this by doing continuous pulls from the master. But again, odds are, if this is a relatively new developer, they will not um, have been doing that. Um, you also end up with things that are effective forks of the project. Uh, I talked with, um, I interviewed the, the uh, lead developer on the Avita project, which is a, um, uh, what's the right phrasing? It's a evolution experiment in a, in a digital test tube. And one of the things they've been finding is they have a central repository. And their students uh, come in, check out, make a branch, make a new branch, because they're using, they, sorry, they're using Subversion. And then they, they develop on that for the next three years. There's no intention of that ever being merged into the main branch. Um, because it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a test research project, and it's going to result in the publication, and that's going to be the end of that code. Well, that ends up being an effective fork of the project, which means now you have to think about what's going to happen if you find a bug in the, main, in the master branch, or if you find a bug in this other branch. It, does the bug still exist in the other branches? How do you communicate interesting and useful changes back and forth? So essentially, you're now dealing with multiple projects. You also have complicated merges, of course, where you have features that you do and don't want in the main repository. However, and I think this is where a, a lot of my advice is, is geared towards um, making it possible for you to put your code out there and then forget about it, forget about what other people are doing with it. Um, and this, 
distributed version control uh, frees you from these permission decisions. You don't have to give other people write access to certain branches of your repository. All you have to do is say, here's my code, take it, as long as you're using the version control system that I'm using, Git, Mercurial, Darks, whatever, we can communicate patches back and forth with all that shared history kept, kept there. Um, and if I like what you have to send to me, I will merge it. And if not, well, that's fine, right? You have everything in a version control. We can maybe consider merging it later on. Now, the great news is that uh, GitHub, um, Bitbucket, Gatorius, SourceForge, and to some extent, Google Code all support one or another distributed version control system. So this is really a decision you have to make, but it doesn't need to be impacted by whether or not you have access to servers capable of dealing of publishing that kind of repository. Um, I should say one thing we've discovered in the Python graph database project, Pyger, is that of course the process can still and is general, generally so if you have multiple developers under central control where you have developer B pulling things out of the distributed version control master, making changes, communicating them to a public place, at which point developer A can then integrate them and push them back to the master repository. So of course my, my main point here is just, my, my point here is just that um, the, uh, the tech, just because the technology gives you the freedom to be utterly chaotic doesn't mean you actually need to be or should be utterly chaotic. You can still put process in place. Uh, the technology just frees you from adherence to a particular process. Okay, so, uh, you know, open source versus open development. Um, you'll, you'll often see projects that are open source but not uh, what I would call open development. And that's the person who's put the source code up but you really have essentially no insight into what changes they're making, why they're making those changes. There's no way to interact with a developer. You're, you're basically uh, stuck outside the room that they're in, looking in as they make changes. Um, and the number, that's one of the reasons why I suggest mailing lists and, and keeping your version control system open. Uh, and the real question you have to ask is, do you want to just release the source code or do you want participation? And I would argue that, that you want participation. The problem is that participation comes at a cost, and it comes at a cost in both support time and your own attitude. One of them, you, you have this annoying loss of control, and I don't know how many of you are academics. Professors are really bad at losing control. Okay, let me rephrase that. So um, professors lose control, but they like to pretend that they have a solid handle on everything going on in their lab. This then translates to micromanagement, uh, sometimes in the lab, and often of code and intellectual property and ideas and results. Um, uh, so it's just something to keep, into mi keep in mind is that, that this loss of control is something that will result from doing an open source project properly. And actually, uh, again, Victoria has some list of reasons why people don't want to do this. I don't remember where that is on the list, but it's got to be in the top 10 somewhere. Well, lot like the idea that people don't want, to sh don't want to put their code out there and let other people do with it what they will. Yeah, and it's the number one reason the older professors I've interacted with don't want to don't want to open up their development process in any way. They say, "Oh my God, what happens if someone takes my code and does something wrong with it?" It's like, well, again, refer back to earlier statement. Chances are about one percent that somebody else will ever look at your code, and even then, if they do something wrong with it, well, they might also do something right with it. So you, you sort of have to think about your role in the scientific process. Um, okay. You also get annoying questions about design decisions you may have made. Frank, otherwise known as insulting discussion of bugs, often on a public mailing list. Uh, and horror of horrors, time-consuming code contributions, where other people give you code that may even fix problems, and you have to review it, make sure that it actually fixes your problem and doesn't introduce new, new problems. Now, the irony of these very annoying things that, are both, that both require a change in attitude and support time is that these are the hallmarks of a successful open source project. right? You no longer have tight control of the development process. Other people are all of a sudden collaborating with you on design decisions one way or another. They may even be pointing out places where you did something wrong. I realize that's a very unscientific thing to do, sarcasm, but uh, it, it's something you definitely want. And then, you know, God forbid, somebody's not only taking your code, run your code, has opinions on your code, but actually wants to contribute back to you. And that's sort of what you're going for, but it is also annoying. Okay, so, um, so that's, that's my, uh, you know, I, I tried to come up with one or two takeaway. I've, I've always heard you're supposed to have one takeaway lesson from a talk, and I, I ended up with two um, because it's science 2.0. And uh, 
One is, I think that the, really the only technological decision you have to think about is whether or not you're willing to invest the time and energy in a distributed version control system. Everything else, it doesn't matter. You go use Google Code, you go and use SourceForge, whatever, you're going to have all the issue tracking and wiki and, and, and open repository, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, you just need to decide whether or not you're going to use them effectively. And that's um, more difficult for me to give opinions about. So, so the second part of my talk is um, hinges on an anecdote. And this is one of these anecdotes that over a period of, of 10 years or so in my life resulted in a complete sea change in the way I approach science. So the anecdote is this. I was working in global warming. I was actually working in climatology, um, physical meteorology, whatever that actually means. And the, uh, the project that I was working on is a project called Earthshine. Earthshine is a very neat idea. The idea is that when you look at the moon, when it's a crescent, the bright part of the moon is lit directly by sunlight from the sun. The dark part of the moon, if you look at it, is lit uh, much more faintly, several orders of magnitude more faintly, by light that is uh, bouncing off the Earth, hitting the moon and reflecting back at you. Do, are people familiar with the concept of Earthshine, with this concept of Earthshine? That is, the, the smaller the moon, sorry, the smaller the, the wedge of the moon that's, that's uh, lit directly by the sunlight, the brighter the rest of the moon actually is because of this light that's, that's bouncing off the Earth and hitting the moon and coming back. Now, when it bounces off the Earth, and, goes to, the, and, and hits, you know, goes to the moon, and then you, you look at it, you can actually um, assess how much light is bouncing off the Earth, which is otherwise known, which is related to a parameter known as the albedo. The albedo is basically the reflectivity of the Earth. And uh, it's essentially what the greenhouse effect is modifying. Right? More sunlight, the major energy balance for the Earth comes from sunlight. Major energy input for the Earth comes from sunlight. If the amount of sunlight... Uh, sun energy, solar energy retained goes up, temperatures go up. Uh, Steve can probably argue with, with that, but that's essentially the broad, you know, uh, oh, good, that, I was right. Okay, so, so um, now why would we care? Well, it turns out that uh, you can go find an observatory that's used during the day for solar observing, and you can retrofit it by strapping a telescope on the side, and you can use that telescope to take pictures of the moon at night, and uh, for a cost of, oh, say, about $100,000 a year, you can get an estimate of the albedo on a pretty much continuous basis whenever the moon's in the right part of the sky and so on and so forth. Um, the great thing about this is it's way cheaper than sending a satellite up to look down at the Earth and take pictures of the Earth and figure out what the reflectivity of the Earth is directly. And in fact, there's a bunch of other nice issues relating to calibration. You have an internal reference with Earthshine because you can see how much sunlight the sun is putting out in the first place by looking at the bright side. So all sorts of fun things you can do. So we did this, and I, I um, went out to uh, Big Bear Lake in California, and we you know, hung off telescopes, wielding wrenches, and taking pictures uh, using a very sensitive CCD camera of the uh, moon. And then we needed to process the data, and we had you know, a couple thousand images. And there's all sorts of things that you need to do in order to correct for things like atmosphere. If the moon's up here, it's, you, you're seeing it through less atmosphere than it's over, if it's over there. And if you're looking at it over there from Big Bear, it's, it's the, the moon is... Um, the moonlight's coming at you through the air over LA, so you have different kinds of corrections that you need to make than if it's coming from over there, where it's coming from Eastern California, where pollution is not really a factor. Um, so lots of, lots of fun corrections you need to make. And I came into this project as an undergraduate and uh, ended up working on it for an entire summer after everybody else had quit because the, the uh, right, that's, that's what you do with undergraduates. You throw them at the research projects that have failed and you hope and you, know, you see what happens. Um, and uh, the, the uh, end, the, what I ended up doing was uh, basically uh, going through the source code of the PV wave, co the PV wave code, which is basically written in IDL, a Fortran-like language, which is horrible, um, and uh, trying to figure out what the graduate student that had been working on this before he quit for lack of results had been doing. And it turns out what he'd been doing was in a desperate attempt to get smooth numbers out he'd been applying the same correction multiple times in different places in the source code. Right? So, well, you know, if you get bouncy numbers out, maybe if you apply the correction one more time, they'll smooth out. Right? I mean, that's... Everybody understands that sarcasm? Okay. So, so his attitude really was, there's no such thing as too many corrections. And I, I, can, I don't know what he was thinking. All I know is he's gone on probably to climate modeling, and, uh, you know, we all know what's happening there. So... Um, so the stunning realization for me was that we really have no way of knowing that our code works. I mean, okay, so you know, how obvious is that? Well, I, I think it's pretty obvious at this point, but 
since I'm trying to speak to the software carpentry students primarily. But trust me, we really have no idea whether or not our code works. Basically ever. Right? All we can do is gain hints. Um, and in particular in this project, you know, the only pre people looking at the source code were the graduate student and me. The PI, he was just looking at the output. And we had, uh, luckily, we had a pretty good theoretical model for what was going on. But we were looking for places where the theoretical model deviated from the data we were collecting, because that's otherwise known as the interesting stuff. So if your computational pipeline sucks, you're going to get spurious results out the other end. And then you have to chase them down. And it ends up being very time consuming, a lot of hard intellectual work that's not really very much fun. That was probably one of the most miserable summers of my life so far, but apart from the fact that it was Fortran-like code. And um, what I realized was really we have no way to know that our code works. And, and in any case, in research programming, there's a real good question, which is, what does your code works mean anyway? Right? Gives you the results that your PI expects? Excellent, right? No arguments. OK, but are they right? right? Well, every time I've tried to chase down situations where my PI and I disagree, well, okay, maybe not every time, uh, I've been right. The, the code's been doing what I thought it should do after a lot of work, and the PI's theoretical model was wrong. So I've actually got, come to the point where if, if, I, if I see agreement between two different sources of data, one of them's probably wrong, and therefore they're both wrong. So they need more investigation. So I take this really paranoid, suspicious view of code, and I think everybody else should too. It's almost never right. OK. So, so you know, then I, became an then I became more advanced, and then I became an educator. And uh, as my career advanced, and I realized, you know, we actually really don't teach this. We don't teach young scientists how to think about software. We don't teach them that not only is their code probably wrong, but everybody else's code is probably wrong. We don't teach them how to think about it. We don't teach them how to deal with it. We don't teach them uh, processes by which they can at least uh, attack this issue. Um, basically, if you, for all of you who have been in graduate school, you get handed a computer if you're lucky. Otherwise, you get handed somebody else's old computer. And uh, you get handed a programming language. And if you're unlucky, 20 to 200,000 lines of source code in Fortran, C, Perl, or Python, and told, make this work, generate results, here's what we want to do. Right. Um, and that's, that's really about as much as we educate people in the process of computational science on the programming side. Um, one of the interesting myths, I, I did not come through my undergrad degrees in math, my graduate degrees in, in developmental biology. Um, I did not come through a CS program. So now that I'm in a CS program, I see two reactions to, CS, to this question in the minds of people from outside CS. One of them is, um, wow, they must, we, we're just not doing it right. They must teach this in computer science. Right? We're just not doing it right, and well, we don't really have the time to, to train people properly. The other reaction is, yeah, I've listened to computer science talk about this, and they don't know what they're doing either. This is actually correct. Um, these are hard problems. People have been working on them for decades, how to make correct programs. Uh, I can describe in mocking terms the various camps out there. But basically what it comes down to is, unless you're willing to spend incredible amounts of time, energy, money, resources, uh, we don't have a good way. We don't, you know, it's, what is it? It's fast, cheap, and good. Choose two, right? And in research, almost always you choose the one that doesn't involve money, the, the two that don't involve money. So um, CS, we don't, we, don't teach, we don't teach this stuff in computer science either. Um, interestingly, fear does not seem to be a sufficient motivator. Um, people have died. Uh, to, I think this was an order of magnitude miscalibration in a irradiation machine. Uh, uh, a programming error uh, caused Pfizer some, some serious stock, stock market damage. Um, my favorite, because this actually happened while I was in graduate school working in a related field, is that um, there was a, uh, a folding package that came out of, I think it was La Jolla, uh, the, um, it's not the Salk, it's the other one. Anyway, scripts. Um, where uh, basically there was a flipped sign in one particular area of a, of, a of a protein structure calculation. And papers and grants were rejected because they disagreed with the gold standard of the field, which was this program. Right? Five years later, they discover, gosh, we flipped a sign. And they had to retract three science, one nature, and one PNAS article. Right? I would imagine that did some damage to somebody's career. Um, now, what's interesting is this was not this was not a case of this was not like that. Uh, I'm forgetting now. Is it Bell Labs or AT&T? This is not a case of misconduct. This is a case of how are we to know? 
And I think what's interesting here is, you know, I said, at the, I joked at the beginning about how I, I, I want to use technology to solve social problems. It's a social problem if you're rejecting experimental data based on its lack of agreement with the computational algorithm, I think. It may be equally problematic to do the reverse if you've ever done wet bench experiments. Um, I, can, I can tell you that they are not that reliable either, but you want to figure out why they're different. You don't want to just reject one out of hand. And this is a, a change in thinking that needs to occur among scientists as a whole. I'm, that's, out of my, that's, that's past my pay grade. I only talk about software. Okay, so um, you all use version control. Uh, you have a build script so other people can use your, can download and, and use your software, right? Okay, good. Excellent. Greg, Greg has taught you well. Um, okay, so my, my solution, my panacea, really is uh, automated testing. Um, and it's, it's actually not, okay, it's not a panacea. It's, it's basically another way to help make sure that your, your programs work. And people are actually generally unfamiliar with the concept, I found, so I'm just going to lead you through maybe five slides. So uh, the basic idea is you want to write test code that runs your main code and verifies that the results are what you expect to see. Um, probably the most useful set of tests, kind of tests for scientists, I think, are regression tests. You have some big complicated set of code. You feed in some data that you believe, that gave you results that you believe. You record both the input and the output. And every couple days or every couple minutes, whichever, you do the same thing with the latest version of the source code. If your input is the same and your output changes, you go figure out why, right? Um, so this, this answers the question, did my program change? Again, this is different from, is my program correct? But if your program, either your program was correct to begin with or it's correct now, you can't have it both ways. So if it changes unintentionally, you should probably figure out why. Uh, and there's an obvious synergy with version control if you're not using version control and you detect a change, then you have to go figure out what the hell happened. And that's, I, I don't even know how you would do that without version control. Um, functional tests are a little bit lower level. You're not dealing with big blobs of programs. You're dealing with a specific functional path through your program. And the idea is you read it, for example, if you want to test your, your, your data reading uh, routine, you read in known data and then you write some, some code that checks that the, the stuff you've loaded in matches the expectations that you've defined by looking at the data that you've read in with your naked eyes and comparing it to what the program says. And it answers the question, does your data loading routine work? And if it doesn't work, you should probably fix it because all your results are wrong. Uh, and uh, you should also think about testing with tricky data, stuff that, shouldn't, that, that you're worried about. Basically, you want to use this testing to, um, was, that, was that two five-minute hands or one five-minute? So 10 minutes or five minutes? OK, great. You have two hands, never mind. OK. So, um, so another very nice thing, and this is actually probably, uh, well, uh, this is probably, if there's anything, if you don't use asserts, take this away from this talk. Um, every, every programming language in the, in the world basically has an assertion. Anyone that, that people actually use for science has an assert statement. Uh, the assert uh, statement is something that lets you just say, hey, if this is not, if this condition is not true, die horribly. Uh, and, you know, so the kinds of questions you can answer with this, especially in languages like Python, which are not statically typed, um, do I ever pass garbage into this function? Well, uh, you'd be surprised at how often the answer is yes. I do not understand what's happening with this function. I'm passing from somewhere in my code, I'm passing something in. Um, and, uh, you know, basically, okay, what, what's the, what's the uh, nuclear disarmament word? Trust but verify, right? You have to trust that your code's basically working, but what the hell, it's a, it's a single statement. Verify it, too. Um, and I, I really think that this is probably, if, if you've never used assert statements, forget everything else I'm saying. Just go use them. Um, you have no excuse. They're in basically every language. Uh, my favorite is, and, and you're never, you're, this is the one time you're going to hear me say something positive about Perl, but the, the die unless is a beautiful, is a beautiful command. Um, okay. So uh, one or two other things. There are a couple other kinds of automated testing. If you read the Agile software development literature a lot, you'll see stuff about acceptance testing and GUI testing. Um, I have yet to meet scientists. Um, I've yet to meet scientists who write GUIs in the first in, in the first ninety percent of the effort on their research project. Um, acceptance testing is more for situations where you know what the answer should be because you're writing, say, an accounting program, um, and I I don't find it works too well with science. Um, okay. 
People get frightened away because they feel they need to use specialized testing tools. There are a lot of them out there. You don't, you don't need to use them. You can just use diff and shell scripts for regression tests. For functional tests, just write some specialized C code function or Python script that does what you want it to do and interacts with the rest of your code that way. Uh, and uh, you just put asserts in your normal code. And actually, it turns out you can disable them by turning on optimization anyway if you really care. Although I think you should ship asserts with your code turned on by default. But. OK, uh, so I did lie. Um, there are two testing approaches that I think really benefit from specialized tools. One of them is code coverage. And I've given whole talks on why code coverage is a, analysis is a really great idea. The basic thing is you run your code under control of, in, of some script or other, and you, you record what lines of code were executed in that process. And if you run your entire test suite, your entire set of regression tests, so on and so forth, and, and, and functional tests, you'll discover places in your code that are never executed. And that can, help you, that can help lead you to places where you can simply remove the code because it's never needed, or conversely, identify places that you should be testing but aren't. Um, and this is actually uh, something where you need a specialized tool. The other thing where I think there's actually a real dearth of tools is continuous integration. Um, and the basic idea here is uh, if you have your, so, so you know, the typical graduate student scenario is you're working on your Linux box uh, running Slackware and, uh, or Debian or whatever, and you try running your code, um, and, and that's all you ever run, your, run or test your code on. How do you know that it works? How do you know that it's 64-bit safe? How do you know that you can give it to people running Mac OS X and have it work on their machines? Well, you don't unless you actually uh, build and, and, and run the tests on those machines. But you don't want to have to have all those machines in front of you. And so continuous integration is basically this idea that you have a bunch of build clients that build your software, run the tests, and report back. Hopefully, they report back successes. Um, this really helps uh, for people who hate Windows, like me, because um, you can just have a Windows build machine running over there that tells you when your code breaks. It's come in really handy for us in the Python Graph Database project because we promise to support Python 2.3 and 2.4 and 2.5 and 2.6. And it turns out they're not perfectly backwards compatible, um, as they're supposed to be, because the Python core developers do actually fix bugs. So there are bugs that we were inadvertently that had been fixed in 2.4 that were in 2.3 that we were uh, that that, that were, we were triggering. Um, and so you know what this what question this answers is: Is there really a chance in hell that anyone can use anyone else can use my code? Um, and you know again. Remember, the, the genesis, the, 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 the focus of this whole talk is how do you get other people to take your software and use it? If they can't build it on their machine, they can't use it. OK. Um, so I think one of the nice things is you know, automated testing, people say, oh, well, you know, I'm not going to have 100% coverage. Um, I'm not going to do everything that I should do with testing. So you know, why, why do I even start? Well, I think fundamentally, you know, that's, first of all, that's, completely a, that's a really bad attitude. Um, because you'll never start. If it's an all or nothing thing, you're never going to start. But for me, what it does, and this is where it's been life changing, is it locks down boring code. And boring code I define as code that I understand, or that I think I understand. I guess I should be appropriately suspicious. If I understand the code in, in scientific research, it is by definition boring. Um, and it lets you focus on the interesting code, which is presumably what you're either debugging or working on, 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 on adding to. Um, it gives you the freedom. Uh, having automated testing more and more gives you the freedom to refactor, tinker, or modify your code. It lets you perform maintenance on your code without worrying that you're breaking something that you're not testing at the moment. Um, and, and here's, you know, again, getting other people to participate. Other people can also do those things to your code. And that's really valuable. OK. So uh, one thing that I'd like to, an idea that um, one particular toolkit has, has taken advantage of is why not automate user reports so a user downloads your code and wants to run it? And this, this is a concept for VTK and ITK, which are two graphics toolkits written in C++ that are pretty widely used. Uh, and it's just this sort of dashboard concept where you have a, um, a web server running that receives reports from clients. And all of these clients are um, you know, Joe Blow downloading your code, building it, running the tests, and then the results automatically getting sent back to your, your central server. So you can figure out if somebody's running if, somebody's, if, if your code is broken on somebody else's server, and they don't even have to file a bug report. You say, oh, it breaks on Mac OS X, crud. Isn't that likely to piss some people off? Oh, you can I mean, you, you have it turned off more. You can have it turned off or on by default. I mean, yes. But if you limit yourself to what's not going to piss people off, 
Um, you have a short, you have a long and boring life, um, as opposed to a short and very exciting one sometimes. But okay, so uh, so VTK and ITK is actually an awesome place to go for for interesting ideas. They also have this thing called the Insight Journal, because VTK and ITK based software has this common tool stack, CMake and CTest, which replace Make and um, nothing because most people don't test. Um, uh, they, you, you can actually submit your code, your image processing code, to the Insight Journal, where they take your submission, build th your submission, run the tests, and make the, the, the results of the tests and a code review part of the review process for publication. And it's almost like they care about having correct results. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm done. So, okay. So, uh, concluding thoughts. Um, if you want to suck people into your open source project, and I think there are many arguments for why you want to do this, um, uh, or at least several, uh, you can help make that happen by choosing technology appropriately. And basically what it comes down to now is use an open project hosting site, and for the love of God, use distributed version control systems. Um, an overlapping and complementary goal, uh, write correct software, that's much harder. Uh, but I think automated testing can help with that as well as having other people use your code. Um, and just a couple acknowledgments. Grig is one of the first people that turned me on to agile testing approaches in general. Alex uh, is a VTK ITK developer who introduced me to um, all of the very neat tools and approaches they have. Greg um, keeps on inviting me to talk about this stuff. Um, and what I really appreciate about Greg is that he's one of the few people that is more cynical than I am about current programming and more optimistic than I am about the future. And I value both sides of that. Um, and of course, uh, this is my daughter who uh, is extra cool in her sunglasses with socks on her hands. So any questions? Do you ever run into the um, uh, the problem that occurs in, in some scientific communities where there's a paranoia uh, about this kind of openness because they're afraid of being scooped, um, they're afraid that journals won't print their papers if any part of it has ah. ever appeared on the web? So yes. Okay. So yes. So um, first of all, I, you know, there's there's a culture. This is this is not a technology problem. This is a cultural problem. Part. Second, I've actually had a paper rejected without review. Because, and I, and I quote, and this is the journal Biotechniques, if anybody's interested. Um, the, the, I, I submitted a, a, a web server and graphical user interface for doing comparative sequence analysis and, and um, of regulatory elements, basically some biology stuff. And their response, and part of what I said in the, in the paper was, there are hundreds of people using the software and it has worked well for them. And, and they rejected that without review, saying it is clearly not novel. And I, I did not actually, I, I mean, I literally, I was like, I don't know what to. Res I don't know how to respond to that. Um, it's useful, uh, maybe is a correct, correct response. So that's so that's just my personal anecdote. BMC Bioinformatics published it without much of a complaint, so that was nice. Um, I, I really don't know what to do about that, except that I think the journals have to take the lead in saying, okay, you don't have to publish it under an open source license, but it has to be. So an open source license implies that you can take the code, modify it, and redistribute the modifications. I can. I can sort of understand the paranoia that would lead you to not want that to happen. I think it's silly, but nonetheless. But journals, I will no longer review papers with, for personally, and I don't think journals should, should, I think journals should reject without review, things where you cannot access the source code or the source data, because that is not science. If I cannot look at your source code and see that you have made a trivial sign error, I'm not saying I would notice that you made a trivial sign error, but if I can't possibly do that, it is not science, period. period. I, 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 um, I don't know what to do about the culture. Um, you know, look me up in 40 years when I'm a famous tenured professor. Uh, no longer releasing things under open source, presumably. Sorry. Any other? Hi. Uh, just, uh, just to follow up on that, I, I, I think it is the culture. I think the granting agencies may have something to say with that. If you take public money to do it, you definitely should put the stuff out there. The uh, scientific, uh, numerical recipes is a key example yes. of a bad license funded by public money. Uh, I think the cultural issues 
are going to be there for a long time and are certainly there in, in other fields more so than some of the fields that are talked about yeah. in the open science view. I don't see that changing. I think your view of using uh, distributed version control certainly helps that because you can keep stuff on your private version and then just push public stuff publicly while you're developing it. Uh, and the other comment was on your testing and uh, build, getting people involved. My view is that if people want to use your stuff, they can build it for Windows. They can build, you know, they can submit those patches. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that people have a, it's that time benefit. Sure, uh, absolutely. I don't think people have a lot of time to be running. Yes, yeah, so well, I, I can tell you, I, I certainly don't have the time to make things work on Windows. I delegate that to students who then also have a tough time. Um, so I had some pithy response to something you said. And I'm afraid I've now forgotten it. Um, well, the numerical recipe thing. Yeah. Uh, I, I think, anyway, we're out of time. So I'll talk to you later. Thank you once again.